Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'd like to start with a big thank you to the First Marine Division Band for that wonderful musical program. I'm sure that you recognize the Battle Hymn of the Republic, their last piece, which was one of President Reagan's most favorite songs. On November 4th, 1981, President Reagan stood alongside four other living U.S. presidents, the first time in history that five presidents had ever gathered together before and officially opened the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. It is such an honor to be with all of you today, 30 years later, to celebrate this historic milestone. If you would, please stand for our national anthem. The Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton Color Guard will parade the colors. Parade the colors. Thank you, please be seated. Before we go any further, there are several special guests in our audience today that I'd like to make sure we recognize. And I'll begin with a trustee of the Reagan Foundation and Institutes Board, former Governor Pete Wilson and his wife, Gail. Governor. Reagan Library Director, Duke Blackwood. Duke. Of course, former Congressman Elton Gallagly and his wife Janice, Congressman. Congressman Jay Obernolte and his wife Heather, Congressman. Congressman Mike Garcia's wife, Rebecca, with their sons, Preston and Jet. <laughs> Assemblywoman Suzette Valadares. 
From the city of Simi Valley, in addition to recognizing Mayor Keith Mashburn, I'd also like to thank the city for its honor uh, honorary resolution commemorating the 30th anniversary. Thank you, Keith. And all, a lot of the city council members from the various cities in the county of Ventura. Last but not least, I'd like to play a greeting from a very special person who was not able to join us. Greetings to those celebrating 30 years of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Since its opening, millions of visitors have learned about the life and legacy of our nation's 40th president in Simi Valley. Through President Reagan's belief in our country and his love for our country, he became an enduring symbol of our country. Laura and I were blessed to have known Ronald Reagan and we congratulate everyone involved with the Reagan Library on your 30th anniversary. God bless you all, and may God continue to bless America. Thank you, Mr. President, for sharing our special day with us. Three years ago, before this library's opening in November of 1988, President Reagan spoke at the official groundbreaking of this campus. During his remarks, he said, the story that will be told inside the walls that are yet to be built is the story not only of a presidency, but of a movement, a determined movement dedicated to the greatness of America and faith in its bedrock traditions, in the essential goodness of its people, in the essential soundness of its institutions, and yes, faith in our very essence as a nation. I am proud to say that the Reagan Library has kept President Reagan's solemn commitment to share not only his story, but the story of America and its place in the world. The Reagan Library stands today as the largest and most visited of all the presidential libraries in the United States. It has been home to several presidential primary debates. It has hosted world leaders from Margaret Thatcher to Mikhail Gorbachev. It features new and exciting world-class special exhibits that complement President Reagan's permanent museum. It houses an Air Force One, one that visitors can climb aboard, which flew President Reagan and six other United States presidents. It has served as a schoolhouse for over a million students, teaching them the lessons of civility, leadership, and character. It has provided tuition to hundreds upon hundreds of students who have received over $10 million in college scholarships in the name of Ronald Reagan. It has expanded its intellectual heft in that it now reaches Washington, D.C. with its Reagan Institute just steps from the White House. Our staff there works every day to keep Ronald Reagan's policies and values alive and well in Washington and the world. To complete President Reagan's unfinished business, we have grown the foundation's endowment in the last 10 years to over $250 million. And of course, this incredible library serves as the final honored resting place for both President and Mrs. Reagan. Importantly, presidential libraries are living institutions, for they are the repositories for the papers, records, and historical materials of our nation's presidents. As such, it is truly fitting to have with us today Mr. David Ferriero, the 10th Archivist of the United States, a position he has held since 2009. And I might add, with Veterans Day only a few days away, David previously served our nation as a Naval Hospital Corpsman during the Vietnam War. So David, thank you for your service to this great nation, from your time in Vietnam healing our wounded to your time now ensuring that all of our president's legacies, including Ronald Reagan's, are preserved and protected for the American people. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in wel welcoming Mr. David Ferriero. Thank you, John. Good morning and greetings from Washington. I'm truly honored to be here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of this wonderful library. The National Archives and Records Administration administers the network of presidential libraries from Herbert Hoover to Donald J. Trump. The Franklin D. Roosevelt Library was actually the first, and we now have 15 libraries. In total, more than 660 million pages of textual materials, 640,000 museum objects, and we're close to reaching the one billion mark in electronic records. That's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> Presidential libraries aren't libraries in the usual sense. They're archives and museums bringing together the documents and artifacts of a president, his administration, and his family, and presenting them to the public for study and dis discussion without regard for the political considerations or f affiliations. In, de in dedicating the first presidential library in 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt captured the essence of the, of the mission to bring together the records of the past and to house them in buildings where they will be preserved for the use of men and women in the future. A nation must believe in three things. It must believe in the past, it must believe in the future, it must, above all, believe in the capacity of its own people so to learn from the past that they can gain in judgment in creating their own future. And that text re resounds exactly, uh, uh, captures exactly the mission of the National Archives today. The Presidential Libraries are a uniquely American phenomenon, a partnership with the federal government a private foundation and the president's family working together to preserve the legacy of the president and his administration to educate, inspire, and entertain. As President Reagan acknowledged 30 years ago in his remarks at the dedication ceremony, most of, these, of those who enter these doors are not academics. They are ordinary people of all ages, backgrounds, and political persuasions eager to examine their past and to explore history not always taught in school. For them, this institution will be a time capsule of American growth and greatness, covering more than a single presidency, honoring more than a single president. Presidential libraries serve many purposes. One of our most important responsibilities is to make records available so that the American people can hold their government accountable and to learn from our past. On the day this library was dedicated, more than six million pages of documents related to the Reagan administration were released to the public. And since that time, the archival team has processed and opened an additional 24 million records, making them available online in the library's research room. I wish to thank the members of the library and mu museum staffs here in Simi Valley, led by Duke Blackwood, for their hard work and dedication to the president's vision for his library. Day in and day out, they protect the records, help guide researchers, and greet hundreds of thousands of visitors to the museum each year. You've helped achieve President Reagan's wish that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. I am most proud of the creative approach this library has taken to address the nation's civic education crisis. The Situation Room experience conceived by the Reagan Library education team led by Duke and Mira Cohen. This exciting program provides students with the opportunity to learn how their government works by assuming the roles of individuals dealing with the real crises of the presidency. Scenarios include Constitution crisis, Washington's cabinet, and the pandemic. Each of our presidential libraries provides tailored educational experience this one exploiting technology in new and award-winning ways. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Fred Ryan and John Highbush and the entire Reagan Foundation and board for their continued support of the library and museum and for the resources and expertise 
they bring to this unique public-private partnership. The foundation supports the development of our temporary exhibits, the docent program, the acquisition of the, F of the F-117, the M1 tank, and the building of the Peace Pavilion, which increased the capacity for large-scale temporary exhibits by approximately 6,000 square feet. They also arranged for the planting of dozens of olive trees that line Presidential Drive after the wildfires. And a special shout out to those goats who do their, <laughs> who do their job in protecting our buildings from encroaching wildfires. We could not do all these wonderful things without the Foundation's support. As we celebrate this occasion and look forward to the next chapter in the Reagan Library's history, I applaud, applaud the efforts of all those at the Library Foundation and in this community who have supported this institution over the past 30 years. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. Our next speaker served President Reagan both as a speechwriter and as a special assistant to the President in the White House. In fact, it was Peter who drafted President Reagan's famous speech in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin, where he so boldly demanded Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. Ladies and gentlemen, our dear friend, Mr. Peter Robinson. Thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, a moment ago you heard that 30 years ago there was a sitting president and four former presidents here. I feel for you folks. Today you're stuck with a speechwriter. <laughs> <clears throat> I should explain that I had a special job on the speechwriting staff. I was the well man. The speechwriters would draft the speech, it would go to the president, he would make his final edits, and then it would come to me. And I would go through the text, and here and there I would insert, well, The Reagan Library on this 30th anniversary. We all sense that this institution is important, but why? The setting is beautiful. It's a lovely place to spend a Sunday as we are together today, but what makes it important? Consider two decades, the 1970s, soaring inflation, chronic unemployment, the Watergate scandal, defeat in Vietnam, a collapse in our national morale. The erosion of our position in the Cold War as the Soviets increased their nuclear arsenal and expanded their presence around the world. The 1980s, low inf inflation, rapid job creation, and economic expansion so vigorous that it would continue for a quarter of a century. A renewal of national morale. Morning again in America may sound strange or flat to us today, but in the 1980s, that phrase represented something real. A restoration of our armed forces and a renewed willingness to stand up to the Soviets. From 1979 to 1989, one decade, this country went from the humiliation of the Iranian hostage crisis to victory in the Cold War with the fall of the Berlin Wall. In other words, we experienced a transformation so complete that it represents a turning point not only in our history, but in the history of the world. Who did that? Well, a lot of people contributed, but it is impossible to tell the story of that transformation without putting one man, Ronald Reagan, at the very center. How did Ronald Reagan do it? The answers to that question lie right here. In this library, you will find the deliberations that in 1981 led President Reagan to adopt a new zero-zero negotiating position that would have required the Soviets to dismantle every last one of their intermediate range nuclear missiles. Arms negotiator Paul Nitsa found that position exasperating. Mr. President Nitsa said, I don't even know how to present that position to my Soviet counterparts. Well, Paul, President Reagan replied, you just tell the Soviets you work for one tough son of a bitch. <laughs> In 
1981, that year, the Soviets did indeed walk away from the negotiating table. And in 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev signed the INF Treaty. In this library, you'll find meetings between President Reagan and Fed Chairman Paul Volcker. As Milton Friedman later told me, no other president would have said to the Fed, keep on doing what you're doing to combat inflation. But Reagan understood that in order to break inflation, he had to take a recession, and he had the political courage to pay the price. In this library, you will find boxes filled with draft after draft of President Reagan's speeches. June 2nd, 1982, over the objections of much of his own staff, President Reagan said this to the British Parliament. Karl Marx was right. We are witnessing a great revolutionary crisis, but the crisis is happening in the Soviet Union. March 8th, 1982, once again overruling much of his staff. You may notice a pattern here. <laughs> Once again, overruling much of the staff, the president said this in Orlando, Florida. I urge you to beware the temptation to label both the Soviet Union and the United States equally at fault, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, to ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire. June 12, 1987, yet again, President Reagan overruled much of his staff in the limousine on the way to deliver this speech, the president remarked, the State Department is going to kill me for this, but it's the right thing to do. Minutes later, he stood before the Berlin Wall and declared, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I had something to do with that speech myself, and I can't help noting that this library contains, oh, no, 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 no. All applause today for Ronald Reagan, and Pete Wilson, you've applauded him once. Those are the two, the, the, the two dessert. <laughs> Folks, I was just a kid speechwriter, honestly. On the other hand, as I said, I can't help noting that the library contains uh, a memo by a senior member of the National Security Council warning against the Berlin Wall Address. You can find this, it's in there. Uh, he called the speech mediocre and a missed opportunity. Now, you'd suppose that after all these years, I wouldn't be sore about that. <laughs> but I am. And in this library, you'll find letters that explain a source of Ronald Reagan's personal strength. That's, <clears throat> that source was Nancy. Uh, when, you aren't, when you aren't there, the president wrote to his wife, I'm no place, just lost in time and space. Moral clarity, courage, a certain shrewdness, a certain stubbornness, the support of his wife. This library tells that story. And this brings me back, if I may, to that joke I made at the beginning about being the well man. I tried that joke not long ago on a group of Stanford students. <laughs> I put in, well, I got nothing. <laughs> blank faces. And for a moment, I was flummoxed. And then I realized these kids were too young. The rising generation possesses no memory of the 40th chief executive whatsoever. President Reagan, the Cold War, all of it is vanishing from lived experience. Soon, only this library will tell the story. <clears throat> This library is important, even more important now than it was 30 years ago. The library will forever remind Americans of the danger that we always face. Freedom, as Ronald Reagan put it, is never more than one generation away from extinction. And this library will forever stand as proof, proof of our capacity for overcoming that danger, for engaging in national renewal, for reaffirming the dignity of each life. To quote Ronald Reagan one last time, the idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Thank you.
Well, you can see why we invited Peter to speak. Uh, some of you may be aware that we had planned a flyover to begin this ceremony this morning, but because of the fog not having lifted, we had to cancel that. But I would be remiss to say that we got something even better from the United States Air Force, and that is a visit from Secretary Barbara Barrett, former Secretary of the United States Air Force. Thank you, Secretary. My next introduction is for a relatively new friend of the Reagan Library, but a good friend nonetheless. He is a hero on the battlefield, a former United States Naval fighter pilot, but he is also a hero to our local community, for he serves as the United States representative for the 25th Congressional District. That includes the Reagan Library. It is wonderful to have him and his family here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Mike Garcia. Well, thank you. It's a tremendous honor to be here to be able to celebrate this uh, magnificent anniversary of, of our Graceland. John, I think we need to have a motivational speech for our flyby pilots, though I don't know what they were complaining about. Well, uh, <laughs> Get some Navy guys to do it maybe next time. <laughs> Madam Secretary, no offense. <laughs> well, I miss Ronald Reagan. I think a lot of us do, especially given what's going on in, in our country today. And this, this library isn't uh, just a place where we come as conservatives. This isn't just a Graceland for conservatives. This is hallowed ground. And it's a reminder of a golden era in our nation's history, a sort of photo album that we can thumb through and remember what success of a nation on the back of morality and hard work looked like and felt like. It's a vehicle to travel back in time to a period when we thrived as Americans and took pride in the American spirit, took pride in American adventurism. We faced challenges and challengers and overcame them with dignity and strength, and in doing so, we evolved closer to a more perfect union. And as Peter mentioned, the world was not a calm nor predictable one in the late 1970s and 1980s under President Ronald Reagan. It was quite turbulent, in fact. We fought an existential Cold War and shed American blood on our own soil and abroad. The shadows of communism were long and dark. We fought a cultural war then, as we do today, and the prospects of a world war were real. But under President Ronald Reagan's leadership, we navigated the rough seas with courage and with confidence, with a sense of duty towards not only our blessed nation, but also to the entire planet for the good of humanity, for the survivability and fate of the entire globe. As we sit here today in an era of our nation's history that remarkably parallels the late 1970s going into the 1980s, in a world where instead of the United, the USSR and the Soviet Union, we have the Chinese Communist regime. In a world where the intercontinental ballistic missiles travel further and travel faster. And in a world where the cultural ills of socialism still behave like a cancer in our blood. It's in this world today that we struggle in our own current Cold War. And it's in this world that I believe that this library means more than it ever has in the last 30 years. President Reagan once stated, we cannot stop on the foothills when Everest lies ahead. Peter, did you write that? No, okay. <laughs> what an amazing honor being uh, here with Peter. We cannot stop at the foothills when Everest lies ahead. And, and in geography, that's, that's sometimes easy to define. It's a clear cut uh, line sometimes between the foothills and where the mountains begin. But in geopolitics, the lines are less obvious and sometimes blurred. You actually may be on Mount Everest and not know it. You actually may be in one of the toughest climbs and challenges of your nation's history while your gear is still back on the foothills and not know it. This is why we must always be prepared. This is why we must always be vigilant. There are two giant bears still out there named China and Russia, and they're just outside of our tent. And we as a nation, must behave and act like a benevolent dragon. A dragon with a wide wingspan, focused eyes, sharp talons, and a long flame. 
We need to nourish the benevolent dragon and ensure the world knows our strength and our resolve. But you see, the point of owning a dragon is ensuring you never have to use the dragon. And a great nation with seasoned leaders like President Reagan understands that. He called it peace through strength. This beautiful library isn't just a graceland for conservative values, it's a beacon of hope for all Americans, regardless of political affiliation. And within these walls, it's a tribute to America's finest president. And within those walls lays the recipe for continued American exceptionalism. And with our exceptionalism, our continued leadership of all humanity. You see, in our species' long journey, from the time we were learning to walk upright in painted caves to now when we learned to walk on other planets, no single entity has contributed more to the good of humanity than the United States of America. And no human being has done more for our country and the planet than President Ronald Reagan. <clears throat> and this library reminds us how he did it for 30 years. We get to enjoy this, this beautiful place. May we never forget the words in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and may we never assume that the survival and success of our country is preordained. We must be willing to work together, and when necessary, be willing to fight together. We must take pride in our victories and never be willing to be the victim. We must know our history, but never turn our back on it. And we must never forget our mission of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. God shines on all of us and favors the United States of America. And President Ronald Reagan sits next to him right now. Thank you all. Mike, uh, Secretary Barrett sent a note up to me noting that we have an Air Force One here, we have the F-117 stealth fighter. She's wanting to know how you might help us get the USS Ronald Reagan, the aircraft. Global warming, madam. <laughs> to speak at the Reagan Library is a high honor. There are a select few individuals who have been invited to speak here enough times that you need two hands to count the number. There are a select few individuals who are held in such high esteem that we marvel how they can take time out of their busy lives to join us. And there are a select few individuals who I am truly humbled to be in their presence. Our next speaker is all three. She is a professor, a diplomat, a best-selling author, a national security expert. She was only the second woman and the first African-American woman to be our nation's Secretary of State. She was also the first woman to be our nation's national security advisor. And don't forget, she is a world-class pianist who has played for the likes of Queen Elizabeth II and performed duets with Yo-Yo Ma. In the summer of 2011, she represented Mrs. Reagan and the Reagan Foundation and traveled the world over to unveil statues, rename boulevards, and lead delegations of American dignitaries, all in honor of President Reagan during the centennial celebration of his birth. In 2016, the Reagan Foundation bestowed upon her our Peace Through Strength Award. It recognizes those who have applied with constant purpose a strategy to strengthen our armed forces and safeguard the lives of the American people. Ladies and gentlemen, a remarkable American Please join me in welcoming Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, I don't think President Reagan was let, going to let us get out of here without sunshine, and so uh, his beautiful California came through for us. Well, my how time flies, 30 years. I just want to start by congratulating everybody who has made this possible. Uh, people like John and Duke and on the foundation side, Fred Ryan, and thank you for what our nation does to preserve our presidential heritage. I want to thank, too, this wonderful community that has embraced and welcomed this library. Barbara, hello. It's so great to see you. I love the Air Force myself. <laughs> and I just have to call out Pete and, and Gail. Um, great governor of California, following in the footsteps, of course, of the great governor of California, Ronald Reagan. Yes, it's been 30 years, and today is a chance to remember this great president, but also alongside him, the vision and the stewardship and the love of his soulmate, his life's mate, Nancy Reagan. And of course, all of the supporters and the board members and everyone who has made this day possible. This 30-year celebration is for all of us. As we reflect on the 30 years and the success of this endeavor, I want us to just take a moment to think again about the purposes of this library. And I want to suggest three among others. First, the importance of remembering. Remembering Ronald Reagan and his historic presidency. How, when he was elected, politicians and pundits and ordinary citizens talked about America's decline, talked about America's malaise, talked about how our best days were behind us. Does that sound familiar today? Ronald Reagan just said no. Our best days are ahead of us because we are America and we are Americans. In that belief, in that strength, he was an antidote to those days when America was feeling that perhaps its days were behind. He lifted us up, put us on a different road, and oh, how we soared. Ronald Reagan was an antidote because of his unfailing confidence in America his unfailing belief in our values, his plan of action, his amazing ability to communicate a vision, and his unforgettable sense of humor. Ronald Reagan lifted America in those days, and that is what we remember in the documents, in the way that this museum reflects that, that moment when you can stand uh, in that Oval Office and think about what it must have been like to walk into that day after the inauguration and say to yourself as Ronald Reagan, I have to lift America up. And he did. And so remembering is one of the important reasons for our celebration today. Another reason, though, for our celebration today is the teaching and informing that this library does. When you are a university professor, you are forever aware of the passage of time and the passage of generations. That's especially true when your students now are walking up to you and saying, you were my mother's advisor. <laughs> now, to be true, it's startling at first. But after a while, you come to accept it fact that generation after generation after generation has passed. And perhaps it does reinforce your sense of responsibility to make sure that they know. I was in a class a few years ago, and a young woman was giving a report on the Soviet Union. And she kept referring to Leonid Brezhnev. Leonid Brezhnev. I thought, why is she mispronouncing his name? It occurred to me she'd probably never heard it because she was not born when the Cold War ended. These young people did not experience a world in which Europe, and indeed the continent, were divided 
by a wall. And the president stood up and said, tear down that wall. I was Secretary of State. I know what must have been happening in the halls of Foggy Bottom that day. <laughs> How could he have said such an undiplomatic thing, they would have said. But he said it. And perhaps Gorbachev heard it. But more importantly, the people of East Germany, captive behind that wall, heard it. And they knew that they had a champion for freedom, their freedom, when they could not speak for themselves within the White House of the United States of America. Those young people would not remember the massed forces across the fold gap that America's military strength through the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was conferred on all who sat in the shadow of Joseph Stalin after World War II. They would not remember that those massed forces represented a real threat, not just to the physical security of Europe, but to the values that were emerging on the right side of history's divide. They would not remember then that it was a president, Ronald Reagan, who said that those military forces had to be rebuilt because they were not just America's. They were the forces of the free world, the shield of freedom. They would not remember the nuclear danger at the time. They would not remember that we had tried to control nuclear arsenals through arms control treaties that just accepted it as fact that Soviet and American forces would be somehow equal. They would build, we would build, they would build, we would build, and we would find strategic stability in that idea. No, Ronald Reagan said, this time there will be a class of nuclear weapons eliminated, but I will not eliminate mine unless you eliminate yours. And he would get, in 1987, the Enemy Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that would do precisely that. And I remember, Peter, that people who were a part of those negotiations said to the great Paul Nitze, that Ronald Reagan said to the great Paul Nitze, tell the Russians what do they not understand about zero. Those young people would not remember that there was a time when the Soviet Union was astride not just Europe, but was pushing its power into Afghanistan, pushing its power into Latin America, pushing its power into Africa through scores of proxy forces from places like Cuba and Angola. They would not remember that Ronald Reagan said, not in my hemisphere, and that he would arm, indeed, and support those, indeed, who throughout the world were willing and ready to stand up to the Soviet Union's encroachment into almost every continent of the world. They would not remember that Ronald Reagan understood essentially that the Soviet Union was dangerous because of its weakness, not because of its strength, and that he would stand there and say, that it was a sad experiment practiced on a hapless population that would one day end up on the ash heap of history. It turns out to have been prescient, but I can tell you that even as a young Soviet specialist in those days, I thought, how undiplomatic. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was not testing himself about how diplomatic he could be. He was testing himself Am I telling the truth about the great struggle between communism and capitalism, between the dark forces of oppression and the light of freedom? Those young people would also not remember 9-11, the fear that day, the sense of peril, the shock that there was somehow an enemy within who had attacked our country 
causing the worst attack on our territory since the War of 1812. They would not remember that. They won't remember a world in which division was not the norm. A world in which somehow we can't talk to each other if we disagree. We just yell at each other. Or we text. Or we tweet. <laughs> but talking to those who don't agree? You see, they would not know without this library that Ronald Reagan understood what James Madison called the contestation of politics. That it took power as well and it took bravery and honor as well to reach across the aisle and to work with those who were your adversaries politically but not your enemy because they too were Americans. And the stories of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, the two Irishmen, doing their thing long after Washington had closed down, those stories would not be known to those young people without this library. So this is a place to remind ourselves how we overcame peril and division, and Ronald Reagan's unique contribution to doing so. Peace through strength, limited government and personal responsibility, confidence in who we are and in our values. And so the third great purpose, to remember, teach, and inform, but the third great purpose, to inspire and to reimagine. Because ultimately, this presidential library is really not about the past. It is about how to mobilize those great virtues in support of an even greater future. To take those lessons of Reagan's presidency and to apply them to our current circumstances and beyond. Peace through strength. I remind people all the time that when Ronald Reagan said peace, he didn't mean the absence of war. He meant a world in which freedom and liberty were safe. And if that took the mobilization of the American military to make sure that those who threatened us didn't even think about it, he was prepared to do that. And so peace through strength not the absence of war, but the affirmation and values of free peoples is something that we desperately need today as we face not a rising China, a risen China. And a China that unlike the Soviet Union, which was, by the way, a military giant, but a technological and economic midget, this China is a technological, military, and economic giant. Peace through strength is not going to mean the absence of war. It is going to mean the defense of our values, the defense of liberty, and standing up for those who cannot speak for themselves, as Ronald Reagan did for East Europeans and others across the world, standing up for the people of Hong Kong and Uyghurs and others who serve under oppression. Ronald Reagan also embraced and taught us the lessons of the importance of limited government and personal responsibility to give the people the room to determine their own fate and their futures, not just because government is sometimes less competent, even though sometimes it is, but because it can squeeze out initiative and responsibility. America's founders reserved certain powers to the federal government and everything else to the states. No, not quite, not quite. They reserved everything else to the states and to the people. And so they expected more of us than they expected of our government. They understood that there was a special demand for citizen to take care of citizen. They understood what 
de Tocqueville would discover in 1835 when he came to see what these Americans were all about, when he said they just somehow organize themselves in these voluntary associations just to do good. Today, we would know them as Rotary Clubs, and the American Red Cross, and Boys and Girls Clubs, and those places where Americans take responsibility for one another. You see, Ronald Reagan understood, as my good friend, the late George Schultz always said, that democracy is not a spectator sport. And so we honor what Ronald Reagan, the president, did today. But we also should honor what Ronald Reagan, the citizen, did. Because he reminded us that it wasn't just Washington. It wasn't just the states. It was us. That we had special responsibilities toward one another. He lived that way, and he expected us to follow. He inspired us as Americans to love our country and to love each other. And then there is what he taught us about America's role in the world. Yes, to always face down your enemies, but to do it from confidence, leading, being that shining city on the hill. The images that he painted of who we are and what we could be spoke to a certain reality. It spoke to a certain confidence. Because Reagan understood that the world without America is certainly a less safe, less prosperous, and less free world. I did go on that trip, as John said, to Eastern Europe in 2011 to London and the Czech Republic and Hungary. First, to, uh, to acknowledge in London uh, this great American and his great partner, Margaret Thatcher. It was a special moment to see that statue go into that place where, from now on, British and American and others who traveled there can see what Reagan meant to the special relationship. But all the best was still to come when we went to Eastern Europe because there, those very people that he had spoken for when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, came out in droves to tell him, thank you, Mr. President. Now we are free. What a legacy in places like Prague and Budapest. What a legacy. What a legacy of a man who was not a dreamer. Ronald Reagan was not a dreamer. He saw the world as it was. But he also believed in shaping that world to be the world as it should be. And that is the real purpose of this place, to draw on that spirit of Ronald Reagan and to reimagine America and the world as it should be. We stand here 30 years later to acknowledge the timelessness of Ronald Reagan and his legacy. Because even though time has passed, leadership and vision and character are timeless. 30 years later, they are as essential for democracy and its health as they ever were. As you drive down that wonderful lane with the presidents of the United States, try to remember that each of them in their own way tried to carry forward the legacy of the founders, that this would be a place in which an experiment of the 18th century, that self-governance could actually work, that government really could be for the people, by the people, that they tried to protect those values and those beliefs, and then come here and remember the degree to which Ronald Reagan believed it lived it, and gave to us all a charge to do the same. Thank you.
just an incredible honor. Thank you, Dr. Rice. We started today's program hearing one of President Reagan's favorite songs, and we are going to conclude today's event by enjoying another, America the Beautiful. But before we send you off to enjoy the rest of your Sunday afternoon, let me leave you with these words of Ronald Reagan. May every day be a new beginning, and every dawn bring us closer to that shining city upon a hill. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America.